I think we'll get started. Um, if other people join us, we can uh, direct them at the handouts and get going. So good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to, read this for the tapes. Welcome to the 40th Color Lab Convention in Cary, North Carolina. Today is Tuesday, March 26th, and this is the Social Glue panel. I am Pam Clasper, your moderator, and your panelists, who I will introduce in more depth shortly, are Jerry Helt, Kathy Helt, Wendy Vandermeulen, and Tom Rudebach. Square dancing is friendship set to music. We hear that all the time. And one of the key points that Denise mentioned on Monday morning in her list of, of things to dealing with change is it's all about the connection. The social part of square dance, we, we make our friends in square dancing. It, it becomes our major hobby and that's where our main friendships are formed. A lot of cases we've noticed that some of that seems to be disappearing. When we started dancing 40 years ago, we always went out after the dance with a group of people for drinks or just to a restaurant for a bite. And, but there was a social aspect. And there are various forms of social aspects within dancing and within the club structure, within ver festivals, various things. And a lot of us feel that this has been diminishing over the years. People go to the dance and go home. And... But that, how many friendships have you formed that have become lifelong friendships at a square dance? And again, it's that connection that you've made with the people. So that's the kind of thing we're going to be exploring this morning. So there's various aspects to it. The, the handouts, there's three handouts over on the, on the white table there, um, if, if you want them. Um, so they're in front of Wendy and Tom, so help yourselves. Um, so... Our first speaker, we're going to start, if you could pass that down, I'll stick with this one. And please feel free to ask, ask no, the, the microphone. Please feel free to ask questions as you go. I will run around and, and come to you because this is, uh, um, I was on the panel last year for this session and it turned into be a very interactive session, which was wonderful. People had wonderful ideas and it was a great discussion. So Wendy Vandermeulen is going to be our first speaker. She's been dancing since 1983 and... Um, has started calling in 2000, so she's been calling for about 13 years. She's called at five Canadian nationals, good supporter, and she's even been to four U.S. nationals, calls for two clubs. She's in the Ottawa area, and I happen to know that the Ottawa area is one of, that's had some real success with some of these social aspects, which is why I asked Wendy to be on the panel. She is also, and I'm sure she has forms with her, she is the general chairman for our next Canadian National next July. It's the 17th to 19th of July up in Ottawa. If you've never been to Ottawa, it is a beautiful city. It is our capital city. It's a very green city. There's lots to see and do in the summer. I can guarantee you a wonderful convention. Uh, Barry and I were among the first 200 signed up. We, <laughs> we will be there for sure. Um, registration is growing nicely. There is online registration that they've got available. So I'll, I'll do my little promo job for you. Um, so please come and join us next summer. It would be great. And Wendy, as I said, they've had great success in Ottawa with, within the club structure of how you keep the social aspect going, keep that social glue that keeps people together, and the connections. Wendy. Thanks, Pam. And I will mention that there are registration forms and postcards out on the flyer table, and I don't want to take any home with me, so please grab a handful and take them back to your clubs, please. Okay, I ha also have a handout here. There are three pages in each. They're not stapled, so you just have to make sure, but it's just going to be exactly what I'm going to say. I'm just reading off my notes here. So, first of all, what it said in, in, uh, in our syllabus, this session... We'll look for ways to encourage more social interaction within a club or group. We have neglected the social side of our activity for too many years, and that may have contributed to lower retention rates. Lasting friendships have always been one of square dancing's most valuable rewards, as folks tend to be more forgiving and enjoy square dancing more when they are among friends. I went to the dictionary. The word social marked by or passed in pleasant companionship with friends or associates, of or relating to, that's just what I'm reading right here right now, so don't worry about picking this up now. I'm, I'm just reading from those notes. You can get it later and take it back with you. It'll just, I'd rather you listen to me than read the notes. Thanks. 
Back to the definition, social, of or relating to human society, the interaction of the individual and the group, of, relating to, or designed for sociability. The definition of sociable, inclined by nature to companionship with others of the same species, inclined to seek or enjoy companionship, marked by or conducive to friendliness or pleasant social relations. So that's the dictionary side. It was interesting that I got the invitation to participate in this panel within days of a short conversation with somebody who commented on the fact that they never see fun dangles anymore. As you know, clubs would organize something just for fun and whoever participated got a dangle. I don't know about your area, but I haven't heard much of such a thing happening in ours for a long time, so I was kind of excited to be able to come and talk about social. And I will mention more about the dangles a little bit later on. So just the fact that dancers get together to dance is being sociable. But our discussion here is about taking it one step further, going beyond the dance. Let's not forget, though, that the social part of square dancing still has to happen at and during the dance. It's not a case of, okay, the dance is over, let's go somewhere and be sociable. But before I go on to what clubs can do to encourage sociability, how many people here are callers in the room? About half and half. Okay, good. Um, there are some things that callers can do contribute to sociability. Last weekend I was on a calling tour and I spent quite a few hours in the car and I listened to CDs, the Caller Lab CDs from the previous two years and a couple of things jumped out at me. First of all, singing calls. The relaxing part of square dancing, the fun part. The patter is all about workshop, it's about teaching, it's about practicing, it's about drill. The singing calls let the dancers let their hair down a bit, relax, have a little bit more fun, interact with each other a little easier for a few minutes. Someone on the CD, and I even heard this just this morning over breakfast, interestingly, said that some callers don't do singing calls with their new dancers until week six or later, and I heard somebody say that a certain caller never does singing calls. To me, that is not good. You want your dancers to get this very simple, basic part of being social as soon as possible. I do singing calls in the second tip of any new dancer group I have. And the only reason I don't do it on the first is I start in a big circle. It's the only reason I don't do it on the first. In singing calls, they loosen up. You can all see the difference in a dancer between the patter and the singer. It's obvious. Secondly, although the patter for workshopping and practicing is and drill, dancers still need to be able to be sociable while they dance. It doesn't mean chatting and carrying on, but it does mean interacting with each other in a pleasant manner. If the calling's good, the dancing's good, and the square dancers are friendly with each other. Every new dancer dance I do, I tell the dancer that square dancing is so good for them for three different reasons. Physically, because they get exercise. Mentally, because they have to think and interpret and process and do. And socially, because they are dancing with seven other people and they are not on their own or just with their partner. My new dancers will tell you how many times, or maybe they can't tell you how many times I tell them, you are one group of eight, you are not eight groups of one. You have to be sociable, you have to interact, you have to get along. So we as callers need to know our choreography, make it smooth, make it fun, so the dancers can enjoy even the learning process. And we can give them singing calls so that they can relax and have more fun while they dance. Something else that is a caller's responsibility is being personably sociable. There's a caller in our area who's an excellent caller, technically. His choreo is smooth, he's creative, everyone likes his choice of music, but he's not easily approachable and he doesn't like going out with the dancers after a dance. That also is not good. We are more than callers, we are leaders, and sociability is an important an area of leadership as anything else in the square dance arena. But now on to a list of things that clubs can do, and these are all just examples, mostly examples from, from our area. One club my husband and I called for has a party night every month. 
this is a, there's a theme most nights because if it's March, it's St. Patty's Day. If it's February, it's Valentine's Day. If it's October, it's Halloween, etc. But often it's just a party. We dance in a church basement that has two rooms. In one room, I teach the basics. My husband teaches the mainstream and calls the mainstream in another room. We dance separately from 7.30 to 9. Then we have a coffee break and we finish the evening with everybody together. But on the once a month when we have a party night, everybody dances together in one room. This helps the new dancers feel like they belong and it helps the other dancers get to know the new ones. Generally, there is no teaching on that night. It's just dancing. The interesting thing is that this was thrust upon us without our even planning it because the smaller hall in the church is not available to us one night a month. So we were forced to have a party once a month. But it's turned out to be such a great thing that our plus night also has a party once a month even there is no conflict with the hall. It's just a sociable thing that we do to get everybody to get together, know each other a little bit better. Another club in our area has a lunch after every dance, every weekly dance. Everyone takes goodies to share, and after the dance is over, instead of just coffee, they pull out tables and socialize over sandwiches and coffee and tea and cookies and whatever. Another club in our area has two dinner dances every year, at Christmas and at the end of the year. Both are very well attended and are looked forward to by everybody that attends. We have two dance associations in our area, and both offer a travel badge. Dancers earn them by visiting other clubs on their regular dance night and on special nights, and they have to go to a certain number of events before they earn the badge. And I tell you, they wear those badges with honor. They are proud of them. Everybody that has one, they've got the whole whack of dangles on them. It's another way to get clubs out of their home club and getting to socialize with the other dancers in the area. As we all know, it's dancing is not just about our club. It's about everything else that goes on out there as well. And of course, banner napping. Is that something that you do in the States? Banner napping? Okay. Banner napping is another great way to get dancers to know dancers outside of their home club and to dance to different callers. An added benefit to that is once newer dancers have experienced dancing to different callers and getting out, they may catch the travel book catch the travel bug and go out to weekend dances and festivals and conventions. Now, how sociable is that? Getting back to food, and as Pam mentioned earlier, do your dancers go out after the dance or before? If it's your regular dance night, maybe they'll just go for coffee at the local donut shop, but if it's a special dance, they may do dinner before or go out after for a drink, coffee, whatever they're up to. And then back to fun dangles. A group that has to organize something together really gels. So if they organize something to get a fund angle, it just really pulls them together. And oftentimes, earning the dangles gets the caller involved. So and that's another way for the caller to be sociable with, the, with their club. And then the last thing, my basic dancers, we do have a graduation at the end of the year. We call it graduation, although we tell them that we only call it graduation because it's a traditional term. It does not mean that they graduate. It just means that they've finished their first year. But they do have to earn the certificate that they get. And the way they need to earn it is to entertain the rest of the club as a group. So it can't just be one person reciting a poem or one person playing his guitar. They have to do something as a group to entertain the rest of them. Only three to five minutes, no more longer than that. They start working on it about six to eight weeks before graduation. So they get together 15 minutes before the dance starts every week, and it's surprising how closely that gets them together. What, they, what dancing couldn't do, because you've always got the stronger dancers get frustrated with the weaker dancers, and the weaker dancers get frustrated because they're not learning as quickly as everybody else. But this, getting them to work together to entertain the rest of the club, it just really, by the end of the year, by the, end, by the time they've done that, they're all best friends. And that works like nothing else is done during the year. So that's just a list of different things that we do. And uh, you may or may not already do them, but uh, I'm sure there's going to be more ideas. But that's from my area. Does anybody have any specific questions for Wendy or comments on what she said? Okay, I have one brief comment. I like your idea of, of the graduate, not getting the newer dancers to entertain the other ones. There's a couple of clubs in our area that have actually stopped graduations because it was that 
your ice, your beginner now, you're going to be in the club. They want the dancers to be in the club from day one. And a lot of clubs, because of the cost of halls and things, are doing the beginners and, say, the mainstream on the same evening. So they integrate them in one way, having the two halls and then doing it part way is a great way. But they've stopped the idea of this graduation because this demarcation. The day you walk in the door, you're a club member and you're part of our group. And that's what a couple of clubs in our area are doing. So, But this idea of entertaining them and, and forming a cohesive group um, is a wonderful idea. So our next... I lost his bio, their bio. There we go. Well, next is going to be Jerry and Kathy Helt here. Jerry began square dancing in the early 40s. He has been a full-time caller since 1953. So 60 years. <laughs> you told me. <laughs> so he's been calling for 60 years. They're in the Cincinnati area. He, he's been a recording artist, uh, he's been on stage, uh, television shows, he's been on the program of the National Square Dance Convention since 53, he's done exhibition, taught people, you know, the handicapable wheelchair groups, children, featured articles in um, National Square Dance Magazine, etc. He's throughout, he's performed and called throughout the 50 states. He was on the for founding Board of Governors of Caller Lab, inducted into the American Square Dance Call... Society Hall of Fame in 1979. He received the Caller Lab Milestone Award, which is the highest award we present, if you don't know, in 1992. He is also a sculptor and an antique collector. And Kathy has been wonderful and long-suffering and a doll. And as you may know, they started their presentation early. They were at the door to greet you. Jerry and Kathy. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. How about a little more volume on this? I got a soft voice. How about a nice hand for our MC? <laughs> Pam, yes. Well, believe about 20%, maybe less, about that uh, bio there or whatever they call it. Um, we had the pleasure of meeting, I think, and shaking hands with everybody in here, did we not? Come up here. <laughs> I want to shake your hand. Mike, thank you. Sure, Eric, good to, you good to see you. Oh, the best part of all. The uh, <clears throat> theme here seemed to be, was that social glue? I think we tried to maybe establish the social glue at the door. I hope so. And at that, I'd like to give us, give the group a slight test. Would you put both feet on the floor, please? You know which one's the right foot, which one's the left foot? With the right foot rotated in a clockwise circle. Clock, clockwise. With your right hand, make a normal figure six. What, what, what kind of a group do we have here? What <laughs> spastic group? I need a little more volume on this. Anybody? Now, we tried that with uh, many groups, and we found over a period of 20 years that we found two people that could do this, and both of these people had back surgery. Does that tell you something about our medical surgeons today? I think as square dance callers, we have this job to do of calling. We've got all this stuff in our brain about what to do next and how to get our levels going and how to come here and there. But sometimes we miss the challenge or the, if we want to call it a challenge, of handling people, of being a social person that you pass that on to somebody else. I hope we started that at the door. I, I'm basically shy, believe it or not. And it was very hard for me as a caller 
to get up and, hi, how are you, you know. But you have to train yourself to do that. You have to work at that. How many callers do we have here? How many wannabe callers do we have here? <laughs> okay, good. Anyhow, I think we we start the social bit of the evening by doing what we did back there, if you can do that, uh, if you have time to and so forth. Get to the dance early enough to get set up so you're not doing all this technical thing while people are coming in. And I think you plant the seeds at the door when they walk in as to what kind of an evening you're going to have. You're going to have a good time. We're going to convert you to a relaxed person to enjoy the evening of dancing with music and calling, of course. And its uh, I think it's an art, maybe, uh, to, to learn to do that, but you have to do it. its That's all part of our dancing. We're social people, and we have to have that. Again, social glue, I guess it is. Yeah, right. Um, I'm told that when you do a, a session like this, you should have some humor in it. And I think that business with the feet probably was about the only humor you're going to get out of me. When do you, uh, I think a lot of groups have, re how many, uh, most groups have refreshments during the evening. Do you do your refreshments while the dance is going, or do you do it at the end of the evening? During. I would suggest that you do the refreshments sort of at the end of the evening so people will stay <laughs> if you got a bad night, you know. <laughs> people will stay. I think we have some groups close to our area who in the middle of the dance start serving this full meal and people come, they get a nice, cheap, easy meal and a little bit of dancing. But it really disrupts the whole idea of coming to dance and being social and having a good time. And I, um, I, if you can convince some of the people who you're dealing with to maybe make that change, sometimes we're dictated by the person who runs the club and says, we want to do this and we like this level out here. We'd like this done, and we'd like that done. And they put a load on you as a caller that sometimes is pretty tough. How, do you, how could we change that? How could we get that to, to change? Any idea? How about a suggestion box? You ever thought of that? How many have a suggestion box? I shouldn't say this, but... How many would stuff the suggestion box? <laughs> we wouldn't do a thing like that, would we? No, 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 no. So we take the suggestion box, and if we've got an idea that we need, our refreshment should be at the end of the evening. We've got three suggestions here that we should change that program so we have the refreshments at the end of the evening. Of course, you've stuffed the box. <laughs> Make sure that you keep the key to the box. So I, it sounds like a con job. Maybe it is, but I think it's for the benefit of the group to do something like that. And it's up to you as a leader to say, let's make some changes, but let's do it in a nice way so it looks like it's being done by the whole group. Is, does that bother you? Would that bother you to do something like that? Would you think you're pulling something over on the, the dancer? I think you're helping the dancer, and they don't realize it. But it's again, it's kind of up to you, your relationship with the group. I'm, I'm really now talking about regular club callers where you have a regular group and you're with them to every other week or every week. And that's a tough job for a caller. 
to go there every week and be a nice guy and smile or a nice lady and smile and be nice and work the door and do all those things. But it's our job and we have to do it. I'm going to uh, express myself here about a, something that really bugs me. Anybody know what eye strain is? I do my groups like this, and I teach my dancer to do that, and I do this, and I do that, and it's my, and, and I, this really bugs me. And I hear this so much from callers, from people who are involved in this dance. I listen to this whole session, and I heard a lot of eye strain. It's something you should consider as part of your language to try to eliminate that thing of I, me, maybe go to we. <laughs> but it's something that, consider that. Think about uh, do you do that a lot? I don't know. But I hear, hear that a lot. Um, where, which, how are we going here, Mama? My, well, we're only about halfway down the thing here. Okay, birthdays are very important for people. And we did a little birthday session the first night. Anybody in there when we did the birthdays? They all... I'm getting a funny look. It scares me. We did a circle, and there's a happy birthday record, and I'm not really sure about what it, where it comes from or what it is, but it's a happy birthday record. And what you do is get everybody in a circle, and everybody, especially somebody that has a birthday on that particular night or particular day or week or whatever it is, Let's say it's the January, they got a birthday. Everybody that has a birthday in January, step to the center of the circle. Good, give them a cheer, okay. February, March, go right down the whole line of months. And you can do it with that record. And uh, there's enough music there that you can get everybody up. And then you end up with a very climatic ending of everybody singing happy birthday so you cover all bases that way. Everybody has an opportunity to celebrate their birthday, which makes it a little personal. You're doing a little personal touch with those people. Um, let's see, what else do we have? What's that? Oh, yeah, anniversaries. Anybody in the group that has an anniversary, it's good to celebrate that. And uh, I think with a club, you might, if you got a real good secretary in the club, they might make some notes on birthdays, anniversaries, all those things you should have. So you can say tonight, Mary and George have their celebrating their 25th wedding anniversary. Let's celebrate that tonight and give them a hand and recognize those people. Everybody likes recognition. And I think as callers, we don't, we get tied up in what we're doing with choreography and with all the mechanical and all the things that we're doing, and we neglect really touching bases with those people out there. They're your, I don't want to say customers, they are customers, but they're actual people that you're dealing with, you're, you're contacting those people, you're talking to them socially. Now, I guess that would be under social glue, would it not? Could I tell a bad story right now? Well, I got an evil look then. She smiled. <laughs> she, smiled. she didn't smile. <laughs> it seems that uh, today in our society, especially in the sports society, as you all know, they're out canvassing the country looking for hot shot basketball players or baseball players or football players and they get them into their universities train them and they're playing on their teams and there's a whole thing with this uh, sports deal there's a sports deal going on right here to now 
but it's baseball, isn't it? In the, hotel. in the hotel, yes. Anyhow, that thing has gone into the technical end of this educational thing. MIT looks around and said, hey, we need people. We want to get some smart students. Have a little bucks, too, if they got to have a little money to go to MIT. Aren't you an MIT man? Jim? An employee of MIT. Well, anyway, MIT decides that they're going to really put on a recruiting spell. And they got one of their very sharp, good-looking young professors and got him a chauffeur, a limo to drive. The chauffeur would take him to these different universities around the country, and he would give you a spiel and try to get those people to come to MIT. Happened to be Cincinnati, Ohio, University of Cincinnati, my alma mater, that uh, the chauffeur and the guy, they had been on the road for some time going to all these universities around the country. And this chauffeur said, you know, I've listened to your speech and your whole thing that you do. And he said, I think I could do it and do it better. Oh, the professor said, okay. The next place is University of Cincinnati. I'll put on the chauffeur's outfit. You put on my suit. You get up and give the lecture. Okay. They struck a deal. Come to Cincinnati. Chauffeur puts on his suit, the professor's suit. Professor puts on the chauffeur's cap and all the business and sits out here in the front row. This chauffeur got up and he gave a speech that was unreal. I mean, he knew everything about everything and really promoted MIT. I mean, he was really working at it. He, pretty soon it got to the end of the speech and he said, now, will there be any questions? Aha. Uh -huh. One young bright student got up and said, if you take a negative and a positive and you put those two into a vessel and charge that with 100,000 volts, would you have a meltdown or would you have an explosion? He said, son, I'm really ashamed of some stupid, small, little question like that. You don't know the answer. I'm going to have my chauffeur stand up and give you the answer to that question. Okay, my wife says move on. I think we're open right now for uh, questions or not. We mentioned, uh, divi oh, dividing groups. If somebody, if we got everybody up in a big circle right here and we had a lot of people and we're really jammed and we need a second circle, how could we divide that group? Odd and even house numbers. Say all the even house numbers make a circle in the middle and you've divided the group. I think it works. We're open for, oh, we wanted to mention one other thing. How many here use Yellow Rock? Okay. Um, I don't want to preach on Yellow Rock, but I don't, what? Does anybody know what? Yeah, let me explain what Yellow Rock is. Yeah. Back in the gold rush days, if a man had a real strike of gold, he would go into the saloon and hold up a nugget and yell, Yellow Rock, and everybody would hug everybody for the simple reason that he's going to buy everybody a drink because he's got the money. And that's where Yellow Rock started. But we use it today in dancing, and I'm a little opposed to it for the simple reason that some people don't like other people hugging you. There's a little jealousy thing with couples sometimes. 
And the guy he goes over and he gives her a big hug and pats her on the butt. And we got troubles. That's my feeling on Yellow Rock. I don't believe in it. Broken ribs, you've had all kinds of problems with it. Uh, it's something that you, you're forcing something on somebody that is not comfortable. You may think it is, and most callers, maybe you're calling a lousy dance, you're not getting any noise from those people, but you say, Yellow Rock, hey, you hear all that noise. And I think that's, you're being a little misinformed as to whether it's a good dance or whether you're just, you know, squeezing somebody and they laugh and they're nice about it just to be polite. Okay. My wife says move on. She runs this show and I just fiddle around here. Questions. Anybody have any questions for Jerry? I and, hope or, not. Or Kathy for that matter. Yes, sir. State your name, serial number. Well, it's not a question. Uh, my name is Mike Gormley, Sebring, Florida, 29644. Uh, uh, Thank uh, you, sir. <laughs> anyway. Write that down, please. <laughs> uh, I just want to make a statement about um, birth. You were talking about birthdays, anniversaries, and stuff with with a club that I had down in the Florida Keys at one time. I, I established a. Uh, Yahoo Group's mailing list for the group. They used to just send out emails to, the, you know, an individual, and every time someone would change their address, every, everybody had to try to figure out how to get their address changed with the, with the mailing group. They, you only have to change it with one, um, you know, system, the, the yeah. Yahoo system. And also along with that, we had a calendar where I automatically put in the anniversaries and birthdays and it came out as an automatic notification to everybody on the mailing list that uh, um, John Jones or, or John, you know, John Smith or whatever um, has a birthday um, today. Or actually what we did is we did it a week in advance because some of them wanted to still send out physical birthday cards. So they wanted enough time for that. So that was one thing we did there. And. I've been thanked many times for doing that because, you know, it's a snowbird type um, uh, club, January, February, March. So when everybody goes home in the summer, um, things happen, you know, to our families and, and the information gets to everybody even when we're not dancing. So Great um, idea. That Great. Worked, Write that down. Worked well. Thank you. Uh Eric Henner Law in San Francisco, California. Uh, a couple of things. One, I want to echo your comment about Yellow Rocks. My wife and I have been dancing not quite as long as you, but a long time anyway. And uh, when we were very young as teenagers, Yellow Rocks were not really appreciated by her or by other people. So I've become very sensitized to that as a caller for 33 years. And I really don't call Yellow Rocks for that reason. Yellow Rocks should be a voluntary thing that's between two consenting people, not something the caller dictates that everybody has to do. Because a lot of people don't necessarily want to do that. But that was my point. Social glue, there was a club in our area, I wish it was my club, but it was near us, that is growing in leaps and bounds. And, of course, I look Great. at what are, the, what are the success stories there. And one of the success stories they have, which we're going to pull out and put into our club now, is that they get a one-page bio for every dancer that the dancer writes. You know, so they get the dancer to write it, and if, you know, if they need help, they'll get some ghost writing in there, a picture of the dancer and a one-page bio about them, and a nice board, some kind of bulletin board they put up. So when it's that month, that month for that dancer's birthday, their bio goes up there for the month so they get to see it. So that every month they get a new set of bios up there. So people get to see who the people are, the birthday, and learn more about the dancers. We're going to incorporate more in that in our club to get more discussion between, dance, between dancers to get bios up there so we can get some more interaction. Our club is kind of quiet. We don't have a lot of interaction. So we want to build that social glue. Great idea. Great. Yes. Here we go. <coughs> Jerry Roby, Gainesville, Florida. And uh, my wife and I are dancers, not callers. Um, a comment about uh, the caller being social, greeting people at the door and, and going around and socializing. Uh, our caller is good at that. I mean, he's very social. The problem I find with that is, you know, between the tips, he'll start circulating the room and he'll get into extended conversations and he's so social that he loses track of time 
right. and pretty soon we're we're all kind of sitting, right. waiting, right. waiting, waiting for the next tip to come up, and we have to kind of sometimes remind him that we're there to dance. Okay, here's a. I say I have a I I I, I can talk to that too. Go ahead, Jerry. Okay. There's a little thing called a timer. It's about this big around. You put that in your pocket, and uh, you set that. And when that goes off, you say, I'm sorry, and you get away from it. Because you can go on, and you'll be talking to three different people, and all of a sudden you've got five, six minutes gone. Uh, many times the round dancing will dictate the time for you because if we're doing a round, when they finish that, you better be up on the stage. But sometimes I, you, you get into that situation that you're talking about. Try a timer. Try the timer. Is his uh, wife or partner usually at the dance? She used to, and when she was there, it was better. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because I, I, I've gone up to Barry uh. many times and said, ding, because that the noise the timer makes. The other... Using technology, and I don't know about the other um, programs used for playing music, but I know that Vic Cedar's system has a facility that Barry uses all the time, and it works brilliantly because what you do is you set, you choose your pattern music for the next tip, and then you set a timer for the break, and when the timer ends, the music starts playing. So everybody in the hall hears it. So he can get off the stage and wander around and everybody knows it's time to square up again because that music is playing over the speakers. Now, I don't know if Square View and it, they, use, they do it as well. So I, I don't know if your caller uses records or uses one of the computer systems. Okay, so, so the timer situation would work a lot better for him. But... You know, if he has it in his pocket, if he gets in a loud area, sometimes they don't even hear the timer. But if anybody that's on computer, they, they have these systems, and that is that just saves all that stuff. It's great. Everybody knows. Mike Gormley, Sebring. Along the same lines, there is an old record out, actually. It's called Yak Time <laughs> that uh, does the same thing. So it's basically blank for a while, and then music starts playing? Um, at one minute, it gives like two, a one chime. At two minutes, it gives, it'll give two chimes. It gets up to five minutes. It gives five chimes and then starts some patter music for like 15 seconds or something, and then it's time to square up. Great. Is it still available, though? Paul Walker, Kannapolis, North Carolina. Uh, I use an egg timer. Very and, good. And uh, I set it for five minutes, and when it goes off, if I'm having a conversation with someone, I don't want to go, whoops, sorry, got to go. I have still two minutes that I can go. But I hear everybody going around going, ding, 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 ding. <laughs> I mean, you know, and I got one guy who's about 84 years old. He's on my case like ugly on an ape. And he gets me up here every time. And then I have line dancing in one club. The other club I call for, we have round dancing. And they're, they're a perfect timer. Besides that, there's music going on almost all the time. So that's what's great about it. Thanks, Paul. Okay, our next speaker. I want to thank oh, Pam. You're finished? Are you finished? Yeah, I'm okay. finished. I'm so, done. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. Could you pass Nice that? hand for Pam. Oh. <laughs> I think, I hope the cord will reach. Tom may have to get up and come around. So our next speaker is Tom Rudabach from Letonia, Ohio. And I'm, that's southeast? No. Pardon? Northeast Ohio. Northeast Ohio. <laughs> Tom started calling in high school. And uh, he began teaching modern Western square dancing in the late 70s. He now has a strong local program teaching for three clubs. And he travels, I think, exten I'd say extensively in the region, sort of a regional traveling caller. Nearly 200 dates a year. And uh, he calls party dances through advanced. He's been calling for 51 years. I remember him getting his 50-year certificate last year. And he has been recording. He's been to 19, been on oh, the staff of every Ohio Square Dance Convention since 1985. He's called at 19 national conventions and has been at, at panelists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He was given the Chairman's Award in 2007 from Caller Lab for developing our marketing plan, and is a past chairman of Mainstream and the RPM Committee. 
and of the Resolutions Committee. He's in his second term on the court Board of Governors. He is our Vice Chairman-elect. He's on the Executive Committee. He will be our Vice Chairman for next year, which we're all very pleased with. And he writes, if you get American Square Dance, you see him every month. He writes on the Square record reviews for American Square Dance. Tom Rudebach. Thank you, Pam. I'm going to get you to ghostwrite for me. <laughs> One correction. Nothing major. Sorry. No, it just, just happened. Uh, I told American Square Dance that it was time to find somebody new. I'd been doing it for nine and a half years, and I figured it was time for somebody else to partake and give of their mighty information. So uh, I told they'll, one of the They'll have big shoes to fill. I told, thank you. I told one of the producers, I said, the only, the only downside is I got to start buying music now. Because <laughs> my only pay was comps. But anyhow, back going back to the uh, social glue part of it, none of the people today have mentioned the beginnings of our local club activity, our new dancers. I think it's important to have them greeted as they walk in the door. We all know that going into an unfamiliar situation, you pull into a parking lot, maybe you don't even know where it is till you get there, uh, working your way toward the door, and if you're, and especially if the people that invited you aren't with you. It's for those of us who are not socially outgoing, it can be very intimidating. We need somebody to be there and greet them when they come in. I've seen clubs do everything from a social hour with hors d'oeuvres or things. And I'm not talking about the recruiting area, you know, if spaghetti dinners or chili dinners or whatever. I'm talking about that actual first night. It's important that they be greeted warmly as they come in. And, uh, and it's important, in my opinion, that the club members greet them. Maybe, and don't, don't overwhelm them, but as a time throughout the night, get out there and talk with them. I think it's important to the best of their, their ability, the caller's ability, it's a, that he or she at some point during that evening, if they can't meet them right away when they come in the door, go up and introduce themselves. Let them know how happy they have to there. All three clubs that I teach with, teach for, have refreshments basically throughout the evening. I look at that. Yes, once they get off the floor, they go start eating and drinking. And, but I also look at it as, a, as an opportunity for some social glue. They get out there and have the opportunity to mix and mingle, and the, uh, the club members have an opportunity to, to visit with them. And if they have any questions or there's some, some concerns, it's a good time to talk with each other. I have a computer. Uh, it does have a timer on it, and I don't use it as much as I should because I like to talk. In more than one time, I've had a dancer come up to me, or I've had a couple experienced angels, quote unquote, get up on the floor and square up and say, Tom, we're ready. <laughs> but uh, that's my fault because I didn't set my computer. I usually set mine at seven minutes, give or take, usually seven minutes. And when the music starts, people start to square up. And uh, then I know it's time for me to get back on the job and do my thing. One uh, or more than one, I think when a new dancer, if they happen to miss a session or two sessions, there should be some immediate contact by the by one of the club members. Some clubs have a uh, what they call a uh, class coordinator. Some clubs, the officers do it. I think they need to be in contact with these people. You know, the first night or two nights, get a name, address, telephone number, email. As Jerry said, their serial number. And any other vital information you want. 
You're awful quiet. <laughs> but get get all that information. And, you know, I, I think our new dancers, uh, those first couple times, that personal contact, a phone call, you know, after that, yes, an email or something. But let's let's be personal the first couple or three times they miss. You know, there could be some health problems. There could be that they're just plain scared to come back. They could be overwhelmed. And get them, and you know, after that, after that you've had them for a while and have retained them for a while, yeah, an email. Say, we missed you last week. Hope everything's okay. If there's anything we can do, blah, blah, blah. As much as possible. And again, I teach for three classes, three clubs. As much as possible, and I don't do it as much as I like to, be, but I'm a, a great believer in personal or card contact. As much as possible, I will send out a personally a card and say, we missed you. Not necessarily ask for a reason. And I will do this personally at, at, at lessons. You know, I don't need an excuse. I just want you to know you were missed last week. That, that personal contact, that so-called social glue that we need to work on. As we progress through our series of, of lessons and, or new dancer sessions, involve these people in your club activities to every extent that's possible. If the club has a, a, a potluck dinner or maybe a theater night, or something of that nature, involve them. We got one club up our way that they have what they call time out once a month. And all it is is they, they rotate a group among a group of restaurants, and it's a social night. I'm sure that I have not been able to go because I teach three nights a week, call two nights a week, and I like to rest one night a week. But no, Jim? Oh, okay. <laughs> but I'm told that they say no square dance conversation, just casual conversation. Now, I'm sure that at some point it, it drifts into the conversation of square dancing. But the initial thought is just to get those people together for social time. And again, it's just they rotate among a group of restaurants. They let them know ahead of time where it's going to be. It's the same time, same same day of the week or same day of the month, not date, but the same second Thursday, second Friday, whatever. Well, it's not Fridays, but same time of the month so that everybody knows they can put it on their calendar that you have time out. They may not know ahead of time where they're going, but at least they got it on their, their schedule. Again, as I mentioned, I think we need to talk about, or in, not talk about, involve them in as many club activities as possible. Uh, another thing I like to suggest and encourage is when the club is doing their planning. I'm not a great believer in all. I don't have a lot of, I have no control over the three clubs I teach for. I'm very frustrated, I'll be honest. I, I consider myself an employee now. I go in, do my thing, and leave. I've tried to make suggestions and too many times, and this is, i got to start thinking more positive, like Denise said the other day. But when you, the club is planning their year, and I've, I've used this with, with some square dance clubs, but of some other organizations I've been involved in, you sit down with a flip chart, and you could do it at a covered dish dinner or a potluck dinner or maybe a special picnic or whatever, or just a special meeting. You sit down and list everything you would like to do. And I've told them, no negatives. One I like to use, right, wrong, indifferent, is let's go on a Hawaiian cruise. You know as a group we can't do that but let's build a theme around it. Let's take all these things that you've stretched way out 
and then add to it, subtract to it, but no negatives. Hand, it, hand all these things over to your core of, of officers or your planning committee and let them take them and see what they can bring together. That's club activity, sociability. Everybody's getting to have some input in what the club is doing. There are, again, I mentioned party nights, or not party nights, but uh, other social activities. Don't forget those. Uh, whether it's a, a theater night, ball, ball club, and the others have mentioned, you know, going out to eat either before or after a dance. Got to tell you one cute story, and then I'll give it back to Pam. I had a had a had a had a dancer come up to me one night at a dance, that, and this most of this group usually went out to one one restaurant or afterwards. Had a club, dancer come up to me and says, Tom. We're tired, nothing against you. We're going home tonight. We're just worn out. We worked in the yard, blah, 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 blah. Went to the restaurant and there they sat. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Appreciate Pam. Appreciate the opportunity to talk with y'all. Uh, I would like to hear some of your success stories. I was going to say, if anybody, one thing that um, that sort of triggered with my thought um, from what Tom said about um, sending out a little card, I, I assume a lot of other people do this too. Um, when I'm in the dollar store, which is a fabulous place for decorations, etc., our local dollar store has a good large rack of greeting cards. I have sympathy cards, get well cards, hi, how are you cards. I have a whole collection of them at home. So that we're ready at any time to do something like that very quickly. I'm assuming that other people do something very similar. Computers make nice cards. <laughs> Eric Henderlock, uh, Court of Madera, California. The last time I was from San Francisco, I moved. Um, we do that. We do exactly that. We have a stack of cards. We bring them with us to our club, and we make sure because it's, you know, Almost every week, couple of weeks, somebody has some medical issue. Somebody's getting a hip replaced, or uh, you know, this surgery, that. And we have a card to physically have everyone sign that card. So it's up front. We announce it so everybody can come up and sign the card for that person. So when that person receives that card in their hospital, wherever they are, they know that it's been announced to the club. The club knows about it. The club's thinking about them. I think it's very important. Yes, I love email. Don't get me wrong. Technology is great, but that card is really, really good. And we also go to the dollar store. We get them by the stacks at the dollar store. Um, so that's a very important aspect. And I also do a newsletter, an electronic newsletter, every week or two for one of my groups where I just sent out, you know, an, kind of an update. And I have a whole email list for them, what's going on, upcoming dances, notes about the workshop or whatever. Here's a question I have for you, and I'm looking for ideas on this. Um, I have one group that is, they're a nice group and everything, but they're kind of quiet. They're not really a social group. And they're not a real talkative group. And I'm trying to find ways of getting them to be a little more interactive with each other. Now, my wife and I, after the holidays, were shopping at Restoration Hardware or somewhere like that, and we found this game, you know, on closeout called Icebreaker or something like that. In a cube, in a box, and you, you open it up, and it's like, like, like anything else. You pull out some cards, and, and it has some, some question, like, where did you go to high school? That's all it says. And then you put it down, and you can, then you have a discussion. Where did you go to high school? And, you know, that spawns a conversation, right? It could be, you know, what city, where you grew up, things like that. I'm looking for ideas like that for the club. How to, I don't want to, you can't change personalities, but it would be nice to find ways to make the club more social within themselves and get some social interaction from people that are kind of quiet and don't necessarily, a lot of people don't have social skills that are really strong about interacting. I think, Jerry, you, you brought that up at one of the seminars I attended from you about 10 years ago. And you comment on that, that, that the people at Square Dance may or may not have the best social skills, and they may not know how to interact with other dancers. So I'm looking for suggestions and ways to kind of prompt that along, is how to get people to get out and interact and connect more with other dancers. Paul Walker again. Um, sometimes we forget the different kind of properties that a human is made of, metal, mental, uh, emotional, religious, family, and you take somebody in your club or even somebody in another club and they're in the hospital and you walk in the door and say, hi, how you doing? Then watch the difference in the attitude when they come back to your club. 
I'm telling you right now, it were, it's, it's just unbelievable what happens. Think about it. Barbie Ashwell, uh, dancer from Oregon. One of the things that uh, we have had a lot of fun with in our area, and we find a lot of participation from our club in doing this, from our club members, and uh, my husband came up with this plan that was very successful, and it's called a RAID, R-A-I-D. And what the idea is, um, we visit lots of clubs up and down the I-5 corridor where we live in Salem, and we'll go into Portland up to uh, Eugene Springfield area. And on a RAID, you don't let them know you're coming. And we use as many of the bigger rigs. We happen to have a van, so we can take seven people with us. And that's fun because you, you get acquainted and you get to talk to people as you're driving to whatever your destination is. But we advise everybody to pack a sack lunch because if you don't notify the club you're coming and you know they have a break time, it's not fair to go in and expect them to accommodate your needs. And usually we make sure we arrive at a point in time after they have started dancing. And we'll go to the store and we'll find a toy fire engine or whatever that's got the siren. And so they'll think this really is a raid and... Uh, we have had a lot of fun with this. Our dancers have had fun participating. I, Jim Mayo from uh, New Hampshire. I have, am thrilled to see this session at Color Lab. We stumbled around the subject of sociability and its importance, but have not, I believe, throughout the life of the or, of Color Lab, given it the attention it deserves. And I can tell you from personal experience that I'm not a sociable being, and I called for 40 years before I began to understand that sociability was more important than choreography. It took me a very long time to learn that, and I have feared that Caller Lab and many of my fellow callers uh, have taken a long time to learn that too, and I'm not sure we're anywhere near as far along the path as we should be. But this session is a wonderful one, and I just I need to add a personal experience to underscore the importance of it. One of the clubs that I had a very difficult time calling for uh, was a group that danced in a church, and they had two Big, big halls. One has sofas and all those things, and then there was the dance hall. And they routinely danced ten squares. Uh, I could never get more than five of them into the hall at one time. The other five were out socializing on the sofas. And I hated calling for that club because they obviously didn't appreciate my skills uh, enough to come in and, and enjoy the dancing. In fact, I was reluctant to accept dates with them. And it finally dawned on me that they had a very important aspect of square dancing under control. And when the club started to fold in the New England area, which happened over a couple of decades, they just disappeared, this club was one of the last to go. Uh, they were thriving when clubs all around them were failing. And bit by bit, the realization of the importance of sociability made it into my very dense skull. I am, again, thrilled to see Caller Lab giving that aspect of the activity and the wonderful things it can do for people the attention it deserves. Lee Ashwell from Salem, Oregon, and I want to thank Jerry and Kathy for greeting at the door. To me, that was extremely important. When we first started dancing, we spent six months after graduation visiting clubs to see where we felt comfortable with the club we wanted to join. We went to this one club, and they happened to have a traveling caller come through that night also. And we were so very impressed as the, he got done with his first tip, circled around the room and said hello to everybody there, including us, 
and everybody likes recognition. If I would have thought at that time in 1979 that I would be t attending Caller Lab and national conventions, you'd have never convinced me of it. But that kept us in square dancing. Uh, has anybody got any, uh, anything to suggest for Eric and his question? Um, do you do theme nights, Eric? Uh, could you maybe, I mean, this handout, the, the one, is basically some bullet points to maybe give you some ideas of things that you can use for sociability. Um, one thing, one of the clubs that, uh, that we work with, they'll assign a small group of people to plan the theme for the party. So, I um, mean, you know, as, as uh, Tom was saying, you know, let's all go on a Hawaiian cruise. Well, I remember one mis couple of years ago, one miserable February, there was going to be a club dance that month. And the group that was organizing it suddenly said, okay, it's Hawaiian shirt day. Everybody wear your Hawaiian shirts. There's going to be a prize for the best Hawaiian shirt and or costume. The prize was a $5 coffee card. Nobody cares what the value is. But the fact that there was a prize and a small group had got together, it, it was kind of forced sociability. And it did bring people out. And then they started, you know, letting their, sort of relaxing, letting their hair down a bit. So that's... You know, that kind of a thing. I mean, even assign a small group to plan the refreshments one week if you have refreshments to do sort of little things like that. With, but they don't really require a lot of, you know, being way out there and, and outside their, their comfort zone. But get them to start doing things like that in small groups. That's, that's just one minor suggestion I have. Kent. I have seen situations like that where, I'm sorry, Kent Forrester, Silver Spring, Maryland. I've seen situations where part of the problem is they always dance with the same people. Um, do some sort of a mixer. So they're not partnered with the same person. They don't have the same corner. They don't have the same opposite. Once they know that they're real people, they might start socializing more. Um, or you could do some sort of a party game where you put a famous person's name on their back and as they're square dancing, they have to ask questions and, and figure out who the, they are instead of who the other people are, who they are. You know, something that would give them a chance to talk to each other instead of just the people they always hang out with. Kathy? Every month... You can figure a theme because January, you could have a snow theme, February presidents, March groundhog or whatever, and April, Easter, May. Have you ever thought of having a Maypole and have a Maypole dance? Mother's Day. So every month you can think of a theme. So there's no problem there. Jim Mayo again, one mixer of the sort that you're asking for that I've used for many, many years is to do two couple action. I, I form squares and then have heads lead to the right circle four and keep on circling, pass through and leave your square, go find another couple. And then two couples. It turns out most of the mainstream list can be done with two couples as well as four. Uh, and you can keep that up for a while. I then, usually for the singing call of that, I form them into a, a promenade circle and end up doing a circle contra, which ends up moving people down the line and it breaks up those clicks that are, are a problem. I've, it's been an easy tool to use and I've gotten very little objection to it. The, the strongest objection I got was one night a guy said, we don't do contras in our group. He, he didn't mind the mixer, but the contra really drove him up a wall. I had a, just a, a few different things that I want to mention. Um, one for Eric, you sounded interested in that dancer bio thing, which I think sounds fascinating as well. And if you implement something like that, how about the idea of the following month, people have the name of a, one of the previous month's dancers on their back, and people have to ask, and he have to ask questions to find out who he is. So that way they're reading... Or, or something like that just to get them. But if it's a name on their back, then they have to, you have to ask the other dancers to find out, you know, who they are. So that's one aspect of it. Um, one comment that I wanted to make about the yellow rock, it's something that I never 
call and I don't really appreciate it too much because whenever it's called, I'm always doing the man's part. <laughs> they never call it when I'm doing the lady's part. <laughs> no fun. And the last thing I want to mention is the, the room that I have, and this is an idea that I'm going to implement uh, next dance season. Um, the room that I have that I teach our basic dancers in, it's, it's, it's in a church basement. So there's a, a small, there's an alcove in the room, which is their library. So they've got a couple of couches, a couple of chairs, and then there's the fellowship room, which is what we're in, which is where... So I set up my table in the alcove and call out to the fellowship room. So the couches don't get used because we line up chairs. And it's like, I think next year, I'm going to set up my table on the opposite side so that they won't sit where I am, so then they'll be... They always go to the back of the room between tips, right? They never come to the front of the room. So if I'm at the back, it'll force them to the front and they'll use the couches and they may become more social and they may get to know each other a little bit better. So thanks, Jim, for the idea. I'd like to brag about my club a little bit. <laughs> huh? Wayne Nicholson from Montgomery, Alabama. I've been calling for the same club 48 years and here's the way they operate. Their secretary has a list of all the people's birthdays and anniversaries, and this is published. On the first Thursday night of the month, we have recognized uh, birthdays and anniversaries, and we play the records and, and sing and have, like you said, the big circle. We got them up there. Also, each week... I sit down and, on my computer and type up a little newsletter telling what we're going to do this Thursday night, uh, the dancers that are in the area and things that they can uh, go. We recognize also the birthdays on there. Another thing on the refreshments now, the refreshments are fine, but on our first Thursday night, uh, we have a couple of couples that, you know, are signed to bring simple stuff. This is called ice cream and cake is about all we have for the birthdays and anniversaries. But on other times, they used to bring refreshments just about every night. And you know what happens to that, don't you, ladies? Miss Brown brings this. Next week, I can do better. And the first thing you know, you have this one-upsmanship and down the road, this poor couple that has it, the next time she's got to put out a spread. So, you know, we stop that. On the fifth Thursday night of each month, we have a covered dish supper. A covered dish potluck. Down south, it's a covered dish, you know. We have a covered dish for anything, you know. You have a funeral for what you do. You take food, that's the first thing. But that's a southern tradition, we call it. But also another thing that we do, uh, we have a, some outside activities. We have a horseshoe tournament, you know. We go visit the, uh, we have a Hyundai plant. We go take tours of that. Uh, also, we have a lot of nursing homes. And we get a group of the dancers and we go out and dance for the nursing homes. And if I can't get enough of dancers together, we have two or three mu uh, musicians, and I'll take my fiddle and we get a guitar player, and we go play music for these people. So they've been operating this way. Uh, you know, in 1965, the director of the YMCA in Prattville came to me and says, uh, I hear you're a square dance caller. We'd like to get something started in uh, Prattville. That was September 1965, and we still dance at Dwight every Thursday night. Thank you. We're about out of fact. We're just a little bit past time, so uh, we're going to wrap it up. Um, before I sort of finally close, um, Tom just reminded me, Please, please fill out your critique sheets. As Tom can attest, as he is currently on the EC, and Jim, because he has been, they read every word. They really do. And they also listen to all of the CDs. 
um, before the executive committee meeting, which is what, the 5th of June or something this year. So they're going to be busy for the next little while. But they listen to everything. They read every word, which is how they plan convention for next year. Because convention is all about you. So things you like, things you didn't like, if you think this should, the session should be repeated, um, any other ideas, please, please, please. Uh, we do want to know all that stuff. So I would like to thank Wendy Vandermeulen, Tom Rudebach, Jerry and Kathy Helt, and all your participation. Thank you very much.